out if you have your Bibles. Turn into Acts chapter 19 tonight as we're going to just, it's been a while since I preached in Acts, so it's time to start acting better, right? So let's get to chapter 19 of Acts and finish that up. Believe it or not, there's only about seven or eight more chapters, but that can compile 18 sermons. And so, um, not that they're already prepared, by the way, but uh, looking at, uh, I know we'd uh, love to continue to go through Acts. So, Acts 19 tonight, and of course, uh, you'll see in probably your heading, uh, it's going to be uh, a riot at Ephesus. I'm using a New King James Version translation tonight. Uh, the difference between the King James Version and uh, the New King James is a lot of it takes out the vowel, the, you know, and replaces that mainly. So usually it could probably, if you're with the King James Version, it'd be uh, easier to read through. I usually use the New American Standard Bible. Uh, believe it or not, uh, I memorized a, a bulk of my verses in the 1980s version of the NIV, whereas the newer NIV translation is more gender neutral. And so uh, in some of the translations type, so I definitely prefer the 1980 version around that version of the NIV. Uh, some would call that the uh, nearly inspired version. Yeah, and so uh, the NASAB, of course, being the closest to the Greek and the Hebrew when it was actually officially written, whereas I know y'all needed to hear all this tonight. The uh, King James Version is in number three, with being the most literal to the Greek and the Hebrew, and, uh, and the ESV is number two. Uh, but the point is, uh, if you've memorized scriptures in the King James versions growing up, it's going to be hard for you to turn to a different translation, is it not? And so I understand that. But for tonight's sake, I'm going to give you a little breather, and I'll use the new King James Version, okay, uh, for tonight. And Acts 19, as we talk about a riot at Ephesus, and it's interesting to know uh, that there is going to be a riot but it's going to be brought about by confusion. Now, have you ever seen some riots that do not make sense in the history of America? Maybe you've seen some here recently, not too long ago. Uh, it would seem like the, the best point would be, as uh, uh, Dr. King would say, is uh, nonviolent resistance, right? And so you are, uh, in fact... Uh, rioting but not doing anything that's against the law to do it okay um, uh, dr king he actually got that from gandhi by the way gandhi was all about non-violence in resisting and having riots in fact uh, it was said about gandhi that he almost starved himself to death so that the muslims and the hindus would get along and then finally uh, it, w it was said that, you know, uh, they were throwing bread at him saying, eat, we, we will, we'll stop, we'll stop. And you know, uh, the big problem between India and Pakistan with the Muslims and the Hindus going against each other, I mean, it's very, uh, very bad, by the way. But that was one of his calls. He wanted peace uh, to happen. And of course, uh, uh, whether you agree with the kind of force was used, um, or not, and the man's knee was on his neck for that long, um, uh, yes, he did a crime, and whatever your point of view is, we're not going to debate that tonight. Um, there are good cops, there's bad cops, I can, I can understand that, but when you throw bricks and put buildings on fire and steal stuff, that's actually going against your cause to be right. You've lost all the validity at that point. As we were talking about in Sunday school, about Gnosticism. The uh, thing about Gnosticism is, is they believe there is no truth. And in fact, that's false altogether because that is a truth claim. <laughs> you're saying there's no truth, that's your truth. Well, there can't be any truth. So what you're saying is nonsense. Might as well go get you some bologna and fry it up, right? Because you're not eating steak. So when we're talking about the riot here at Ephesus, it's to understand that this riot is caused by confusion. In fact, when Jesus was before Pilate, 
when the priest and those involved, the Jewish people, they were rallying up the crowd. And in fact, when you rally up a crowd, after it's all said and done, they might not even know what they were doing. This is what's going on in Ephesus right now. Uh, this crowd has been coming upon the people of the way, the people of Jesus Christ, the disciples, the people that are trying to share Jesus with others. Some are even confused why they're doing it, but they're doing it because other people are doing it. In teenage years, we call this peer pressure. Okay, and here we call it confusion. What's the reality? Why are we really fighting and going against these people? Are they harming us? What, what's going on? And, and it comes down to a monetary value that they have a problem with. It was go hurt their business. Dear friends, if you ever have to act ungodly to get money, it wasn't good to have in the first place. Now we read here in God's Word, it says in verse 21, When these things were accomplished, Paul proposed in the Spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I've been there, I must see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Aratus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a time. And about that time there arose a great commotion about the way. So let's stop here. What is the way? The way is Jesus Christ. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me but by the Father draw him, right? So we know that the door is open only by those that come in. Paired with John 64, uh, 44 that I was alluding to. They cannot come unless the Father draws them. Jesus is the doorway into heaven. He is the only doorway in heaven. When he said, I am the way, what is he saying there? I am the exclusive way to heaven, and there's no other path to get there. We have good-intentioned people in this world that believe that they can go on their own road, you go on your road, and we'll all get to heaven. Well, that is false. There's only one way into heaven. So what is the problem here? The disciples and those that have been saved by Jesus Christ are sharing the gospel with people, and they are saying there is no other way but through the way of Jesus Christ. So people are going to have a commotion. you got to realize this, and hopefully you have in your age, that everybody you tell about Jesus is not going to respond, oh, I'm so happy you told me that. I never knew that. That's a great idea. I want to give my life to Christ. Guess what? There are going to be days on Sunday for the altar call. People are not going to walk and give their life to Christ. But the whole point is this. It's not about opposition. It's about being faithful. You're supposed to be faithful with the task at hand to tell people about Jesus Christ. There's no other way around. There's no fluff in it at all. You are responsible for telling people about Jesus and applying the blood, as Ezekiel talks about, onto their head. But if you continue to walk around with, your, with blood on your hands all the time, and God's already told you time and time again to tell others about Jesus, your hands are going to continue to pile up and get heavy. I mean, I don't know about you, but have you carried around some, uh, some good water buckets around? You might only can go so far with how heavy, I don't care how strong you are, you know what I'm talking about, you got that little, that little metal piece, just that little thin piece, boy, it starts wearing in your hand on it. And I don't care how strong you are. It's about how it's made and so forth. It don't have a, a pad on it or anything. You know, you get those seat belt pads, you know. You can put a little comfortable, fluffy thing on there so it don't rub your neck, you know. You know what I'm talking about? You can get those. I don't have one. I still get neck burn. I guess that's why they call me a redneck. But anyway, what I know is in the comfortable situation, it's not comfortable to tell people about Jesus. They are not comfortable. A commotion has started. People are talking. And what's going from one lip is going to three lips. And then it's going around. It's getting people upset. 
Does that mean that you should stop doing what you're doing and being faithful to Jesus because you upset people? By no means. In fact, they want to continue to tell people about Jesus. But listen to this. In verse 24, For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, smith, who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of similar occupations and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. Interesting enough, this goes back to Acts chapter 17. When he was at the Arapagus, he was there in the marketplace. He was there on Mars Hill telling people about Jesus Christ. And he said, no God, not this God, by the way, can be formed by human hands. What was he trying to say there in that Mars Hill sermon? You can't craft God and say, here, we're going to worship this thing that I humanly have created. You know who else tried to do that? Aaron, Moses' brother. He tried, oh, that thing just popped out as a cow. No, my friend, you had a mold that you put into that fire that was the shape of a cow, and you said, everybody bring your earrings. Moses is taking too much time on the mountain. And they put those things in there, and they melted down just so finely, didn't and boy, out of that fire popped the cow. Come on, Aaron. Moses has been around you a long time. He knows you. And so here we have these workers are not getting their money. This is their livelihood. This is, in fact, another reason why Jesus went in the temple and whipped a lot of people. This is what they were doing it for. They were not doing it genuinely to provide sacrifices for people. They were making profit off God's house. And Jesus said, it's not going to be turned in to this den of robbers. This is a house of prayer. Okay? This goes for churches. This goes for ministries. This goes for anybody else that your main goal is to financially gain prosperity on this world. You have missed the mark by far. It's not prosperity, but prosperity has to be found in Jesus Christ. It's not about having money. It's about the root of evil of having that money. And so that's what's happening here. These men are upset and they're going to other workers. We got to get rid of Paul and everybody that likes the way, the way of Jesus Christ that is preaching this. It's taking away our money. It wasn't necessarily that it wasn't true. It was that it was taking away their money. They made profit by selling these false gods, these deities, these places that you can put upon your headrest, you could put in a dining room, uh, you know. They had these formed and made for them. Now, if you have some ashes in your house, that's okay. I, you know, I'm not uh, totally against that. Uh, you know, I, 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 the reason I wouldn't probably have ashes in my house, I'd probably drop them. I mean, I would do something weird and just stumble and, and fall and they would hit the ground and I, I'd be a mess. Uh, these are not about worshiping a loved one. These were about worshiping gods, gods that did not exist. And I know the people that are in the ashes and the, in the urns, they do not exist, but it's a memory for you. It's a memory of that person in your life if you have those things. But again, it's not about worshiping people. The people are worshiping that are trying to sell these gods are worshiping money and therefore turning it into a prophet so that others can worship false gods. It's a problem. He talks to them about the occupation and deals with the reality. Our bank accounts are getting hit. And in fact, in verse 26, it says, Moreover, you see and hear, not only in Ephesus, but throughout all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling in disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. 
Are they truly concerned with that person's respect? Or are they more concerned with the respect and dignity they want by having a living? And that's what it comes down to. Um, of course, you know, Daniel had to face this when he was in the midst of all that was going on and he was uh, accused and it was put in a decree. Uh, he had to face this too. He was very valuable in the kingdom. And by the way, who else? Joseph being thrown into a prison. I mean, being in a prison doing stuff that was faithful. Okay, coming out and being in command and being falsely accused for uh, being flirtatious, uh, trying to commit adultery. This was really false that we know Joseph ran away from that. And although he is being placed into a jail cell, he continues to remain faithful just like Daniel knew what was wrong was wrong, but he continued to remain faithful. Opposition is either going to break you or make you better. Again, when people deal with problems in their life, they deal with problems in their family, whatever the case may be, it's how you respond to the problems that makes you better. In fact, they are refining these gods so that people could worship them, whereas Paul and the other disciples are refining their lives with character and integrity and in faithfulness and perseverance and faith. That's what matters to the Lord. That's prosperity with a gospel-driven focus. God was going to provide for these disciples' needs. It was not if, when God wanted to do it. He did it the way he did it. God was going to take care of them. But they knew that this world is temporary. That whatever they do down here is going to matter for eternity. So they wanted to continue to send their rewards on ahead of them. You, you see in a book called The Treasure Principle. It's a little bitty tiny book if you've ever read it. It's really good because it talks about sending your treasures on ahead of you. This is what the disciples were doing. This dispute was going to take place. Conflict was going to arise. And it wasn't the conflict that they had their eyes upon. They had their eyes upon the Lord and being faithful to them because at the end of the day, they had to answer to God Almighty, not Diana. And so they worshiped God faithfully. And now verse 28 says, Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aratisigus and Macedonians and Paul's travel companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, go to the people, the disciples would not allow them. When the, some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater, some therefore cried out one thing and some another. For the assembly was confused. And most of them, listen to this, did not know why they had come together. Interesting enough, we see here that confusion breeds more confusion. In fact, they were already confused. When you're worshiping a God uh, that's not Jehovah, that's not Yahweh, that's not Jesus Christ, you should already be confused. Some would say that Jesus came and he turned the world upside down. Dear friends, that is not theologically true. The world was already upside down. He turned it upside right. And so Jesus Christ, when he came, he didn't want to bring confusion, but with the light of the gospel, he came to bring what? Clarity. Jesus is not about confusing us. God is not the author of confusion. Satan is. But again, these are vehicles of Satan. Being divisive, uh, dividing people is a work from Satan. And so the people didn't even know what we're doing anymore. They were confused too, but they continued on in this shenanigan. Did they not? The some therefore cried one thing, some another, for the assembly was confused, and most of them did not know why they had come together. 
And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander motioned with his hand. If you motion with your hand during a speech, this was to get people to quiet down. Now, I'll try that next Sunday I'm here and preaching. I'm just going to get up for a welcome announcement. I'm going to do this and see what happens. You're going to think the pastor went crazy and needs some medicine. Now, but here, he's motioning to the crowd. This was a, a way to get the authority to speak. And, of course, he is going to speak. And Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out for about two hours, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So we see here they didn't get the man they wanted. They didn't get the yes man they wanted. You know, politicians like to put anybody in the office that will get them to be a yes man. And in fact, uh, uh, you know, we got, uh, well, I'm not going to say any names, but we got some that are in there. They don't have a lick of common sense, no background whatsoever. And all of a sudden they got in there just to be a yes man. Whether they were funded by a liberal source or whatever the case may be, they were put in that position to be a yes man. This is on the contrary. They're not getting this. God still protects his people one way or the other. One way or the other. They found out he was a Jew. But guess what Jews believe in? Uh, God, okay? One God. Uh, you can actually lump Muslims into that. Not that they believe in Yahweh, uh, but they believe in one God, right? And so uh, to their view, of course, Allah, we know it's a false God. But here, again, the Jew is going to believe in Yahweh. They're going to know what? That idol worship is wrong. Boy, they know that. The Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, speaks about not having false gods. So they didn't get their yes man. They tried. If I can just get somebody to agree with me and get on my political journey, everything's going to work out. God said, not so fast. And so when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of Ephesians is temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Zeus? Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. Whenever in doubt, remember this in life, sometimes it is okay when in doubt not to do anything about it. Now, you can doubt and be unbiblical by doubting what God wants you to do and not following through. But there are some times when in doubt, don't. Okay? Um, this is one of those occasions. He's telling everybody, take hold of your emotions. You see, we talk a lot, do we not? They, they do SAT tests. They do BSEP tests in elementary. I don't know what all the things. I know they uh, pretty much taken cursive out of uh, education a lot of places it could be a secret language but I'm going to have a good Morse code because I love to write cursive but the point is here is he's telling everybody to think in their right mind we talk about IQ but there's something you need also in your life it's called EQ emotional intelligence now, any of us can fly off the handle it makes things worse. Or we can be smart, no matter how much degrees we have, uh, but still not use that EQ, emotional intelligence, to keep us calm through adversity. Right here, it's not about reacting, but getting people to simmer down and think the truth. You got to remember. A lot of things are going to be said about you or be said around you, whatever the case may be. But what are the facts? The truth is there's probably two or three sides to every story. Uh, the more people keep talking about it, it's just going to bring more confusion. Nobody knows what's going on anyway. Here he is telling them, put your guns down. Put your swords down now. All right, let's think like men and women here for a minute. Let's put this down. Calm down. 
It says in verse 35, And when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of Ephesians is temple garden of the great goddess Diana, and of the image which fell down to Zeus? Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly, right? Do nothing. Sometimes for you and your situation, what does this mean in the context for my real world? How can I really place this into my life? You know how? Sometimes you just don't do anything in a situation. Some things just have to be worked out among others. You know, uh, it's not for you to fix everybody's problems in this world. Sometimes it's for others to learn consequences. For you to learn a consequence. And let the chips fall where they may. You don't have to get involved in every situation. Maybe it's for you to allow people to understand consequences. Maybe it's for us individually not to get involved because we don't see how far ahead God is already at work in a situation. But I'm going to tell you it's hard for me and I'm pretty sure it's hard for you at times. We want to fix problems, don't we? We want to fix them. That's what we want to do. We're Americans. We live in this fast-paced culture, you know, with drive throughs uh, smartphones, Walmart delivery, Sam Club delivery. You don't even have to walk in a store now. You can get what you want. That's the way we operate. But we can go to a third world country and realize patience is a virtue for sure. You have to wait on things. You might have to go catch your own chicken to cut it up. The process takes longer. He's saying don't do anything rashly. Don't do anything fast that you make a bad decision. They were already making bad decisions. They couldn't even understand why they were doing it anymore. Some were walking around like, what am I doing? Have you ever had that happen in your life? You're doing something and you just stop and say, why am I doing this anyway? I forgot. What's the real reason and motive why I'm doing this? And you realize, I shouldn't be doing this at all. Well, here in this situation, he tries to get them calm down and think logically it says in verse 36 therefore since these things cannot be denied you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly for you have brought these men here who are neither robbers or templars or nor blasphemers of your goddess therefore demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have called have a case against anyone the courts are open and they are prosecutors uh, excuse me let them bring charges against one another. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. What is he asking for here? He's asking for order. There needs to be order in decision making. It says, For we are in danger of being called in question for today's uproar, there being no reason which we may give to account for this orderly this disorderly gathering. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. We all need to learn this in our life to be diplomats. You're not always going to please everybody. Did y'all know that? Do y'all know that? <laughs> you know that, Philip? You can't always please everybody? Yeah, we can't. We can't always please everybody. But I read in the New Testament, as much as it counts upon you to live at peace with everybody, as much as you can to live at peace. It also says in God's Word, I believe it's in Proverbs, uh, could be somewhere else, um, that you are to be good if you have the power to do it. You should operate and do the right thing, no matter what. Uh, and so we keep peace. We do things orderly. And guess what? We can all get confused at times. You know, uh, we, we really can get confused at times with the way things turn out or way decisions, this, that, or the other in our life. This here, though, God is taking care of the disciples. In the midst of all this turmoil, let me just tell you, they could have took them out and killed them real quick. No question. I mean, they were outnumbered. But were they? 
God was with them. And when God is with you, the other person that's causing any strife or the enemy, Satan himself, he is the one outnumbered. By the way, Satan didn't take God's job, and we shouldn't try to either. Let God be God and work out your problems. Amen? Let's go to the Lord and pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you just for this lesson, just to remind me and, and others, God, just to not walk in confusion and not be destroyed by Satan's darkness and what he tries to place in our lives, that we would walk in true faithfulness to you. And Lord, when we count the cost, we would realize, Lord, the cost is following you. And that's not going to mean everything's going to be rosy, everything's going to be okay. But one thing is for sure, you are trustworthy to your promises. And you're going to be there with us every step of the way. Lord, Heavenly Father, anyone that's struggling with any kind of confusion tonight, God, you'd bring clarity to their hearts tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. God's people said, Amen. Y'all please stand.